This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins at the same time, allow the Holy Spirit to control us, and that way we can get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity and privilege that we have to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by looking at our outline, where we've been and where we're going uh, today. I am keeping this outline brief, just using the major uh, letters here, capital letter system, and the Roman numerals. We are at Roman numeral 2, instructions regarding the collection for the saints. And then A, this is where we start today, renewing the Corinthians' commitment to the collection. Now we'll get deep into this, and you'll see the value of verse by verse. Well, after praising the Corinthians for their renewed obedience, Paul seeks more evidence of their response by urging them to complete the collection project for the saints in Judea. One of the touchy issues among Christians is the subject of giving. It is so often abused and used to manipulate people, if not worse. For these reasons and others, Christians need to be taught how to give how to receive and then give back. Paul will teach these things. Now, most Christians know they should give, and they're convicted of it. But then they have mixed feelings about whether to do it, how much to give, sacrificially or not. Though many of the principles of giving we will learn in the next few lessons can be applied in different contexts of giving, this context is concerning collecting funds for believers who are very poor, in large part because of their stand for Christ. It's an important topic, yet often ignored in the pulpit, except for those who keep asking for money in one way or the other. It is a privilege to have something to give, and then do it as a service to God, and in obedience to God. Now, Paul knew this subject well. Uh, he was a leader, and that included administrative leadership. He recognizes a need when he sees it, and he seeks to meet it in a biblical manner. Now, there are a few key passages on giving in Scripture. Uh, we're focused, of course, on the New Covenant policies for giving. These two chapters, that is in 2 Corinthians that we're studying, and 1 Corinthians 9 are two of the most prolific in 1 Corinthians, Paul provides some basic principles on giving and reveals why he refuses to take help for himself from the Corinthians. Now, he, he'll take help for others. He'll take help from other churches. But with the Corinthians, there was a problem. So he specifically does not take it from them for the reasons he mentioned, and we studied that back in 1 Corinthians 9. We'll also look at another passage where Jesus taught one of the most important principles on giving. It's for the moving passage. Now, people are not naturally generous. They are, in fact, naturally selfish. Now, that largely depends on what we're talking about. When it comes to money, a lot of people are fairly selfish. Uh, this is because people are motivated by the sin nature and first serve themselves their own self-interest. They find that as a justifiable reason for not helping others sometimes or giving. We often think what is in it for us or what is best for us or I want to have plenty just in case. Well, this is just the opposite of how Jesus lived. He served freely. He often gave freely. And he taught how we are to live in his life and his actions. So, what we see today, the reluctance to give, the selfishness, is just the opposite of how Jesus lived and taught how we are to live. Now, we're talking about Christian giving here, particularly 
Christians giving to help other Christians. Now, we naturally think in terms of what is best for us, far and above what we need, and never give into the never get into the routine of giving on a regular basis. Many never budget for it because they never understand it as an obligation. So there are some important principles here. We will see in this passage that Paul both teaches on giving, receiving, and giving back. And we will look at some of the terms closely and see what many people never see when it comes to giving. All right, let's get into chapter 8. Chapter 8 opens with Paul discussing the collection of funds from the churches in Macedonia. In other words, he just got back from Macedonia, or or is in Macedonia, and it's collected funds from some of these churches. Now, these churches were facing severe persecution, and many of the people were poor, but they have given generously. This will come out in our study. So Paul uses the Macedonians as an example of giving, and they are a remarkable example. Their standard of giving is far higher than most would ever dream. Paul begins by using the Macedonian Christians as examples of genuine giving from the heart. This is verses 1 through 5. Verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, we make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. This in itself is a very interesting statement. We see here first we added and sisters. It's usually in the Greek, just brothers. There's a few passages that have sisters, but it's pretty rare. But the idea, this is to all Christians, okay? Men or women or children. He says, we make known to you the grace of God. Now, let's talk about grace. That's a huge word in Scripture, especially for New Testament believers, for us. The word does have different nuances. This one for the word charis, that's the word. We we translate grace, sometimes favor. Uh, I'll just write on the board here so we can kind of have it to focus on as we talk about it. Charis. It has to do with God's benevolent favor towards us. In other words, he does things for us that we don't deserve, we don't earn. We might even say it comes out of nowhere, but we know it's from God. It's unearned. It is God being good out of his own character, from whom, from who he is, from who he is. Now, Paul describes this grace being made known to the Corinthians through what has happened with the Macedonian Christians. Now remember our our map that we saw. Let me see if I can get it back up there for a moment. I'm working with some new software today. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but I had to do something. My other sound system software was having major issues. Here's our map again, very colorful map. Macedonia's at the top in the center. You can see the churches we're talking about here, the Macedonian churches. There's Thessalonica, Berea, uh, Philippi. You'll see them written about as well as uh, in Acts and in their own letters. You don't see a letter to Berea, but we read about it in Acts. And of course, course, Corinth is down below right here in the center. Okay. Now, so we're talking about the Macedonian churches. We're talking about uh, Thessalonica, Berea, and Philippi. That's the ones we see mentioned in Scripture. So, this grace is made known to the Corinthians through what has happened with the Macedonian Christians. The point is that God's grace worked through these Macedonian Christians, and it shows. It shows through their sacrifice and generosity. Now, Did you hear that? Generosity. Generosity is something God gives. He gives it to us, and it is to flow through us to others. He gives it to us, then we turn around and give it to others. In other words, we show God's grace in our lives when we're generous. The Macedonians were this way. 
God had graciously given to them and they graciously gave to others. Now one might ask, well, how was God generous towards the Macedonians? They were suffering and they were poor. Well, we see God's gracious generosity perhaps where we need to see the biggest lesson here. And that's from what happens with their hearts. They open them up despite their own suffering to give to those in need. Now, this is one of those passages that it will change you if you really catch it. You really understand it and you apply it. It will change you. It will change your giving. It will change your attitude of generosity. It will change your attitude perhaps towards giving and uh, not just giving but being generous and sacrificial towards others. Now, one of the things that Paul does not do here, he doesn't really compare churches, but he does use the Macedonian Christians as an example. Even though the Corinthians were affluent as a people, Paul does not appeal to that and say, you should give more. Or does he tell the Macedonians, you should give less, or maybe not give at all. But Paul speaks of grace, generosity, and the issues of heart. And this is a major principle of giving. How well are you adjusted to God's grace towards you so that you have a heart of graciousness towards others? Now, this is one of those messages that, well, if I was teaching it from a pulpit or a classroom situation, there would be people there in the audience that would be convicted of this, and they don't want to hear it because they know they have not been good givers. And many times, because they really don't know how to give. Well, after this, I don't think anyone who's listening will have an excuse or reason not to understand what giving comes from and answer a lot of the questions I mentioned earlier. Now, as they say, this is a game changer for many. We don't see competition among churches. It's not they're suffering so much they don't even need to give. No, Paul never says that. In fact, that's not an issue. How much one has is not an issue here. It's a matter of each individual's appreciation of the grace of God and allowing that to flow through him or her to others. One more time. It's a matter of each individual's appreciation of the grace of God and allowing that to flow to others. When discussing the collection, even with the Macedonians, it's not their poverty or suffering that is the issue when it comes to support for other Christians. It is their heart attitude. Now observe this. Between the Corinthians and the Macedonians, who are the poorest and the most suffering church, they give generously. It's not the amount that counts. What is generous for some may not be generous for others. Again, it's the heart. It is a good heart properly adjusted to God with a divine viewpoint in line with the purposes of God. They don't stand around saying, well, I'm waiting for the Spirit of God to move me. You see, when your heart is aligned with God, you will make the right decision regarding giving. And sometimes you'll do things giving that no one will understand. Why did he give all of that? He doesn't even have enough for himself. It's the heart, folks. It's the heart. The sin nature measures giving by comparing or looking at the amount or how much that person has already. Oh, he drives a real nice car. He has a nice big house. He has a beautiful church. I don't think he needs my money. Did you even consider your heart there on that? The divine viewpoint looks at the condition of the heart. Or it can go the other way. Are those so, they're so poor uh, they're having such a hard time. Everyone should give just about everything they can to get them out of the hole. Maybe, maybe not. It's still a condition of the heart. Let me say this another way. The goodness, the grace, the generosity, 
that we see with the Macedonians is because they have adjusted their hearts to God and it shows in their actions. If one looked at their personal condition, their income, their suffering, one would expect them to give very little, if at all, and then expect the Corinthians to give a lot more. But that's not the way it is because of the heart. One would have to ask the Corinthians, where is the grace of God in your life? And that was the problem with them. It was their heart. The good news is they're getting back on track now. We've seen that in the last few lessons. Verse 2 begins to tell us what they did. Verse 2. So he goes on to say, which was which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. That's the grace of God. Let me start that over. The grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in great, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. Now this verse says quite a bit. Let's break it down. The situation of Macedonia that in a great ordeal of affliction, or we could have put it, or a great test of suffering. The word ordeal, let me show that to you. We know about the word ordeal, which is the, some sort of difficult situation people go through. Well, that's kind of what it means here too. Dokime, it's a testing process. It's a time of testing for the Macedonians to see what they are made of their character. Paul writes of the suffering at Macedonia. Listen to these verses. This is from 1 Thessalonians 1.6, and then we'll look at 2.14. Talking about the church, one of the churches of Macedonia, Thessalonica. In 1 6 he writes, You also became imitators of us and the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. In much tribulation. They still receive the word. Nothing's going to stop them from listening to the word of God. There's another lesson. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in, notice, in Judea that you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Jews. So is this saying the Jews there in Thessalonica were getting uh, uh, suffering or uh, afflicted from other fellow Jews, or was it the Gentiles? Probably both. Uh, you know how it is if you join a group that isn't, uh, generally popular, how people will say, oh, you're with them, and sometimes persecuted for it. Well, we're talking about serious persecution here because it affected their income, uh, their business, what they could do. Uh, other passages you could look at regarding these churches, Acts 16.20 and 17.5, you can go look at the historical background of some of this. Philippians 1, 29 through 30, there's the Philippians issues and more with the Thessalonians in 3, 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4. Well, the Macedonians knew what it means to suffer. Once you start following Christ, the world closes in on you and you find yourself always in hostile territory. Most everyone and everything is working against you. And this is where many back away from being serious Christians. They want to go back to being comfortable religious people. The Macedonian Christians, they move forward. They were being tested and proven to have Christian character, Christ-like attitudes. So we learn here that the Macedonian Christians know firsthand what the believers in Judea were having to deal with. And this and Judea had went on for years. Notice what's next. That in their great ordeal of affliction, 
their abundance of joy. Still, in their abundance of joy, they were thrilled to help those in Judea. This is their thinking and their emotional state while suffering but wanting to give. Not many people we run across who have this kind of attitude. Yeah, I know we're about out of money. I know we're suffering, but I just want to give. But not only that, look at the next line. And their deep poverty. And their deep poverty. Notice what happened with it. Overflowed in the wealth of the liberality. The deep poverty here is extreme poverty. They were barely meeting their needs, if at all. And yet they have great joy while being able to give and support the poor. It says they overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. Now let's talk about some of the terms here. Liberality. Uh, I'm going to put that on the board. We'll talk about it for a moment. It's a little bit uh, difficult to understand. Hoplotes. It means simplicity, sincerity, uprightness, and frankness. It's someone who's just open-hearted, you might say today, today's terms. And it's, it's expressed in generosity. Their liberality means they give freely. It doesn't hold them up. It's not a hang-up for them. Neither their suffering nor their poverty. That doesn't stop them from giving. And one of the keys to this is coming up in this passage. But I'll give you a, a hint. It has to do with service. It has to do with service. In other words, their open, honest, and free hearts gave generously. They, give, they gave liberally. Even though they were being persecuted themselves and very poor, they were happy about giving to their brothers and sisters in Christ. Neither poverty nor persecution stopped them from giving to those in great need. This is a people who understand grace. Remember, start out like that. The grace of God is seen through them. They understand that even if they give beyond their means, that God will watch over them. He will still provide their needs. And they're not stupid about it because they believe God will take care of them. Sometimes we get in a situation where, well, if I give my money or I give something that I have, then I won't have any. Then you might think, well, who needs it worse? Or maybe you have more faith and you can trust God will take care of it. Maybe that's your test. So they understand that God will take care of them. They just knew that those people in Judea needed help. And they're going to do it. Now listen. Let's talk about the Macedonians. We're talking about destitute Christians. Under persecution. Sending financial help to believers who they don't even know personally. But they can relate to circumstantially. Paul does not mention the amount or percentage. But they were still happy to do it. It's their attitude that was most important. And something you can also, uh, can also remember, God is sovereign. And he knows what people need precisely. And if he knows someone needs something to live on, he'll provide it, his timing, his way. This is a lesson I've been learning a long time in my life, especially when I got into the ministry, because I never knew if I'd have enough to pay the bills for the month. And I hate going into debt. I really do. I hate using credit cards, especially uh, when the interest is so high. So I do about everything I can to avoid using credit cards or pay them off as soon as I can. But the way society is, it's difficult to have much anything unless you have some sort of credit. You know, like get a house or get a car or something big because you just don't make that much cash or have that much cash around. So I understand that also. But you still have to manage it and still always intend to pay it back. 
This is a major point on giving. Let me put it on the board. Here's what I want you to see. Giving is not dictated by one's own personal circumstances, but the heart. But the heart. Now, of course, you'll have to see how much you got to give. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about a heart that gets so hung up on worldly things. How else could you have someone being persecuted, suffering for the faith, driven to extreme poverty, yet giving happily and generously? This is living with a divine viewpoint. Now, folks, I know this is foreign to most everybody's thinking. People say, well, that's not logical. That's not good common sense. I don't even think God would be happy with that. Ever heard that one? How do you know? But underneath these principles lies the greater principle. We've already seen this. I'm going to put it on the board, though. God's graciousness towards us should flow through us to others. I should have said graciousness. God's graciousness towards us should flow through us to others. Real wealth is expressed in these type of terms. In other words, if you want to have true wealth, let the grace of God work in you and through you. If you study Revelation, you know how the church of Laodicea considered itself wealthy, yet the Lord called them wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation 3, 14 through 22. Many churches are like that today. People are well off in their nice cars, nice churches, nice church buildings, nice clothes, and so on and so on, and yet spiritually, they're a mess. He also writes to, John also writes the Lord's words to Smyrna, where they're described as poverty-stricken, yet rich. Revelation 2, 8 through 11. Well, in verse 3, Paul elaborates on what he's been talking about. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily. Let's look at this first part of it, where it says that according to their ability and beyond their ability, Paul had not asked for an amount, except an amount, or ask, expected amount, rather, I'll say that again. Paul did not ask for an amount or expect an amount or ask for a percentage. The Macedonians did not have any extra, but they found it in their hearts to give anyway beyond what anyone would expect. They gave beyond what they could afford. That's what this says. They went over and above their means. And then at the end it says, they gave voluntarily their choice, no force of any kind, not even pressure. This is a people thinking more of others than themselves. That's the way it's got to be done. Now, I will tell you one of the fundamental reasons people don't give is because of lack of faith. God won't replace it. This is what God gave me. He must want me to hold on to it. All sorts of justifications. But people lack faith. Even though God tells people to give and serve and minister, people don't do it, always find excuses, and that's a lack of faith, not to mention disobedience. Genuine need prompted this response from the Macedonians. So the expectations were exceeded, especially under these difficult circumstances, poverty and persecution. Listen to what's next. Here's what these Macedonians would do. Begging us, Paul and his teams, with much urging, two verbs here, for the favor of participation in the service of the saints. They begged. Come on, Paul, let us. Paul might have been reluctant because they were so poor. Are you sure? You sure you want to do this? Begging us with much urging. Yes, Paul, we want it. Come on, Paul. 
We want in this. We know what's going on. They really wanted to help. Was Paul a little short-sighted on this? Probably not. I think he was trying to just be even-handed and an administrative leader. There's some important theological terms here. I don't want us to mess them. We've already looked at the first one. Urging for the favor. That's our word charis again. Or charis. A charis again. Goodwill. Loving kindness. An act of grace. And they wanted to participate in the support of the saints. That was an act of grace. And notice how they put it. For the favor of participation. That's a well-known word among Christians today. Probably often misunderstood. Koinonia. That's the word we have for fellowship, close association, involving mutual interest and sharing. Uh, Also association, communion, fellowship, or close relationship. They saw it as sharing in this ministry. And that's the way giving should be looked when you give to those who are in need or even to churches or uh, supportive ministries. So they were having fellowship with others by sharing together in this service to the saints. That's the last line. Don't mess that. In this service to the saints. The Macedonians saw it as an act of grace for the privilege of participating or sharing in the service. Now, this is a key word, and I want us to understand this word because this is a frequent word we see in Scripture as well. And I will show you some different uses of it, which I think will deepen our understanding here. And the service, diakonia. Diakonia, we're familiar with koinonia. Now, let's get familiar with diakonia. Three main meanings here we're going to look at. Service, ministry, and support. When you support, you're involved in ministry. When you are in ministry, you serve. They all tie together. They overlap. Now, I want you to notice something here. Paul doesn't even mention the word money in all this. But he uses the term for service, for ministry, for support. It's an opportunity for service. Giving of your own resources is service to God and to others. Last line of the saints. Let's just put that in there right quick to complete this phrase. Of course, that's the holy ones. That's God's people. That's God's people. Now let's talk about service. Now, as I said, this word is the Greek word diakonia. I'll just transliterate it as we did with chorus. D-I-A-K-O-N-I-A. First meaning we're going to look at is service. It means service, serving. Second Corinthians nine twelve. I'm going to put some other verses with it just to show you some other references. Here we go. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. We'll see this later on in our study. The ministry of this service. It's a service. In fact, look, all three words are there. I haven't checked the Greek on them yet, but we certainly see the word service here. This is what they are involved in, service towards God. The actual word here, that diakonia, it's actually the one translated ministry. But service is another word. It has to do with more of a sacrificial service. Now let's look at it as ministry while we're there. There's some other verses here. One's called to serve you in 2 Corinthians 11, 8. I think 16, 15 there is obvious. Let's look at the word as a ministry. We just saw it. Okay, let's look at it again as ministry. Let me write that definition down. Ministry. All right. This is from 2 Corinthians 5.18. I'll put some other references up with it. 
Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Do you remember studying that a while back? The ministry of reconciliation. Paul and his teams are out there ministering, giving the message of reconciliation in the gospel. Now the last word we're going to look at is support. Let's just write that down, down, down here. Support also means support. Now this is an interesting uh, meaning. Some of your translators may have translated it support. The word here again, diokinia. And Judaism had a technical meaning in Judaism for supporting the needs of the poor. Now let me just read to you some references on that. In Acts 6, 1, diakonia is used for the daily distribution of food for the widows. Acts 6, 1. In Acts eleven twenty nine, it's used for relief, or depending on your translation, it may say help. In Romans 15, Romans 15 25. Uh, some may say aid or service or contribution, depending on your English translation. So, again, in Acts 11.29, it's used for relief or help. Then in Romans 15.25, it's called aid, service, or contribution, depending on your English translation. But you get the idea. That's a form of support, whether it be aid or service or contribution. When you give... It's an act of service, as an act of ministry. And when we give regularly, we are supporting ministry regularly. That's probably one of the biggest hang-ups people have about doing ministry through giving regularly. I think it's always helpful, and this is what I would suggest, to put in your budget. Put in your budget. Let's talk about this as a whole now. Paul writes of this service. He uses numerous terms that are theological, making this service a spiritual activity. In fact, you will learn that the term service and some of these terms obviously overlap into the word for worship. These are acts of worship. We're giving back to God his grace is flowing through us. His generosity is flowing to us. We give to people who love the Lord, who in turn, who in turn need help. So we are worshiping God through carrying out his will through us. Sometimes we give sacrificially. We serve sacrificially. Uh, we support sacrificially. In this passage, is called a favor or act of grace coming from God, as we saw earlier. It's also a sharing of partnership and service, as we just saw. And these theological words continue to be used, different types of words, in chapter 9, all the way to chapter 9. We'll see terms like earnestness and love, willingly, generously, in abundance, and doing it freely. We've seen forms of those already, some of them. In chapter 9, we see that it's a blessing, a good work at the increasing, a good work of increasing one's harvest. It's an investment into the kingdom of God. I've been especially amazed that well, I have this one program that is supposed to track where people listen to the videos. And I have seen them in China, which kind of surprised me. All right. A number of countries in Africa, and not to mention in Asia as well. And the word gets out there, folks. I don't know how it's doing it, if it's going through YouTube, uh, or it's coming through uh, my website, or both. But the word is getting, getting out there. This ministry is. And the main thing, I want people saved, I want people growing spiritually. I want them serving the Lord and telling others about him. The Macedonians' divine viewpoint saw it as an act of grace to participate, a privilege. This is a sure sign of growing Christians, wanting to share in a material way. They didn't plead poverty or that they were suffering too much to avoid giving. Well, I just can't do it right now. Maybe later on. Maybe things are a little better for me. 
They may never be better. But they actually pleaded to give out of their poverty. In contrast, Paul pleaded with the Corinthians to follow through with their earlier pledge. When God is testing believers on the front line of persecution and suffering, even though they are suffering also and have little like the Macedonians, they thought it as a privilege to help these people. Let me say that, that again. It's probably a little messed up the way I said it. But when God is testing believers on the front line who are undergoing persecution and suffering, even though they are suffering, just like the ones they want to help. And they don't have very much, just like the Macedonians. They still viewed it as a privilege to help these people. It's the heart. The passage seems to indicate that Paul did not expect much from the Macedonians, if at all. But he lets the need be known, and they were ready to go overboard on the giving. And I am amused at the way they put this when it says, begging us with much urging. I wonder if they're nagging Paul. Come on, Paul. Come on, Paul. They really wanted to be among those helping those fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. What an attitude. Verse 5. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Don't miss this very important point. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. Another surprise from the Macedonians. They gave themselves over the Lord. Oh, the Lord's going to take care of us. Why, you don't think God can take care of us just because we're helping those people? The word first here, not first in order necessarily, or first in line, or first time. It's first in importance, most important. But they first, most important, gave themselves to the Lord. And this is where all giving should start. Full dedication to the Lord, and out of that came incredible generosity. Now I know. I mean, if you know that many Christians aren't ready for this type of giving, you have to ask yourself why. What's the holdup? A lot of it is spiritual growth. When the Lord is first, when he is in on it, great things happen. And it starts with the attitude of who you are living for and what is most important in your life. But it didn't, didn't stop just with their giving themselves over the Lord. Look at the end of this. And to us, by the will of God, both important phrases. He says, first of all, and to us. This includes Paul and his fellow missionaries, uh, their work, both in their ministry and their efforts to get this collection down to Judea. They worked with Paul and his teams on this. The inference is that if they were loyal to God, then they will also be loyal to his servants. He goes on to say, and by the will of God. It's all in God's will. Don't miss that. The motivation comes from wanting to do God's will. That's from the heart. Dedication to Christ means dedication to those who faithfully serve him. This is God's will. It is God's working in them just as it was with the Macedonians, so it, so it should be with the Corinthians. Now, let's do a little side trip for a second. There are some who won't always admit this, but there are some who think, well, I just don't know what to do for the Lord. I know I'm supposed to serve him. I know I'm supposed to, to uh, help others. I'm not supposed to do that. It seems like all I can do is just maybe contribute a little bit. Folks, that contribution is a major part of service. You should have caught on to that by now. Uh, you give sacrificially, it's a sacrificial gift. It's that poor old person going into the temple with the only animal they could afford, perhaps a pigeon, a bird, and having it sacrificed and given over to God. That's all they could do with the few pennies they had. But God looked at that. 
He smelled that fragrance and he was pleased. He was pleased. So notice here again at the end it says, And to us by the will of God, it is God working in them just as it was with the Macedonians, so it should be with the Corinthians. God is working in them and the Macedonians. It is also uh, something that should be going on with the Corinthians. So now Paul comes back to the Corinthians. This example by the Macedonians should give the Corinthians a more biblical perspective on giving. You know, sometimes we just have, have to see what someone else is doing. And we may, be, we may be taken back by that. By that I mean we may be so surprised and so shocked that I can never do that. It's a matter of the heart. The Macedonians have given themselves over to God. Once one does that, good things follow. None of the Corinthians should have missed this point of their devotion to God. Maybe that's what's missing. I don't have an opportunity. I don't have anything to give. I really don't want to give. Maybe that's what's missing. It's who are you living for? Now, the Corinthians were not in any kind of serious persecution from the outside. Their biggest problems were themselves. And neither were they poor, by no means. So all the more, they have a clear path to contribute. So in verses 6 to 8, Paul urges Titus to complete the task of finishing the collection. Implied is they're giving themselves over to God. And that's certainly something I hope we all see now. Maybe the reason you don't have anything to give to God because you're not devoted to God. I'm just saying that. I don't know your situation spiritually. But if you are growing, you will have opportunities to serve. Verse 6, so Paul goes on to urge Tim, Titus, rather. So we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning of the collection, so he would also complete it in you, this gracious work as well. So he's still talking to the Corinthians. So we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning of the collection, in other words, some time ago, we're not told exactly when, but Paul is urging Titus to go in there and complete what was started. The word for complete, epitelio, to bring it to an end, to perfect it, to accomplish it. In other words, finish up the collection so they can send it on, forward it on to Judea. Now, this starting of the collection could have started even before 1 Corinthians was written, but now that they have started it and they've started to spiritually recover and get over some of the issues with Paul, they need to go on with it. So Paul prompts Titus or urges Titus to get on with it. Go ahead and collect it now. Maybe they got their senses back together now and they're back on track. We can go ahead and finish up the collection for those poor Christians in Judea. And I expect Paul was really focused on the Christians in Judea. People he had known. Maybe people even give him a hard time. But he wanted them taken care of. And then he goes on to finish the line here, and you, this gracious work as well. So now, who's got an opportunity to let Chorus work through them? The Corinthians. Now, just because Titus is in Corinth with this letter, or with the letter, remember the severe letter earlier, it does not mean that the Corinthians will respond. So Paul is writing them, telling them, what he's urging Titus to do. So Paul is urging them, telling them what he is urging Titus to do. Titus may be bugging you about going ahead and finish collecting the funds. I want him to do that. He's there to finish the work he started perhaps several months ago. He's there with the letter, and they're being urged to follow through with their gift. From both of the letters we have to the Corinthians, they should know how to give. They should be living the spiritual life. This is all part of getting them back on track with God and doing God's will. 
they should be participating in this gracious act. So Paul is lining up the things they can start to do again to keep themselves on spiritual on spiritual track, to keep them in the path of doing God's will and going spiritually. And as we see, they still need to hear that they need to finish what they started. One of the challenges of a servant of God is to get people to do the right thing without sounding too authoritarian or too bossy. So you urge them. You don't command them. You might even say you should. But you don't say, you better do this, buddy. Or do this. But he comes up on the edge of that. He's very careful with his words. You want to see them do it on their own, not pressured. You want to see it an act of the heart. That's important. You want to see it an act from their own heart. And this is what I tell people. I say, when you give, when you give to this ministry, it's a matter of your heart. It's, a, it's between you and the Lord. Between you and the Lord. This passage is a good example of what is so typical of Christians when it comes to giving. They talk about it. They may even get things all set to give, but then they do not. For some reason, they shut it down, and we could probably guess a lot of it was because they had started um, towards criticizing Paul. And Paul was the one that wanted this collection going. But there's really no good reason now. They're back on track. They're doing the right thing. We'll see more of these reasons in the passage here. or We've probably already seen a lot of them. And uh, we're going to come up now in verse 7. And we'll talk about some of the Christian virtues. And that's where we will continue next time. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege we've had to study your word. We ask that you'll challenge us with the things we've heard today. Help us make the proper and balanced application. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.